see if the function is continuous at the given x values. We've got negative 3, we've got 0, and a function is continuous as long as the denominator is not 0. That's called undefined if it is. So what I need to do is I need to plug in negative 3, see what I get, and I need to plug in 0 and see what I get. So let's start out with negative 3. I got negative 3 squared plus 3 times negative 3 again. Negative 3 squared is 9. Uh, 3 times negative 3 is minus 9. That becomes 0. So at negative 3, it is not continuous. That's a big fat no. Let's try it again with 0. I have a good feeling about this one. I'm going to plug 0 into the denominator. 0 squared plus 3 times 0 is going to be 0 squared is 0 plus 3 times 0 is 0, 0 again. So is it continuous when x is 0? No. Now you might be thinking, well, what about the x up in the numerator? We don't care about the x in the numerator. So even though I plug in 0 into the top and the bottom and I get 0 over 0, it's still discontinuous. No good. So that's my answers. Find where the function is discontinuous. A function is discontinuous at the x values that make the function undefined. What does undefined mean? Whenever the denominator is equal to 0. So let's do that. Let's set the denominator equal to 0 and see what happens. Now I have two x's, <laughs> sounds like my dating history, <laughs> uh, and I'm going to factor out one of them. When I factor out an x, I have regular x minus 4 left behind. Now what I do is I use the zero product property. I set each factor equal to zero. So x equals zero and x minus 4 equals zero. Now, when I set this regular x equal to 0, I'm, I'm done that part. And there's nothing to do here. x equals 0. Over here, I can add 4. So x equals 4. And those are my two points where my function is discontinuous, also known as the point of discontinuity. Now, I know if I plug in 0, I get 0 on the top and 0 on the bottom. And you might be thinking, don't those guys go away? No. When you have 0 over 0, when x equals that value, you get what's called a whole. It's still discontinuous, even though maybe if you were to factor things out, the x's would disappear. It still makes the original function discontinuous. Don't be fooled. Estimate where the function is increasing and decreasing. All right, well, increasing means my function's going up. Decreasing means my function is going down. Now, I'm going to try my best to make uh, this uh, as pretty as possible. It seems here that that's where things change. It looks like it's decreasing all the way up until negative 4, and now it's going uphill up until about regular 4, and then going downhill again. So increase here, decrease here, decrease here. Now, it all depends on what kind of format your book uses. I'm going to use what's called, I don't know, just like regular format. It all depends on your teacher. I'm going to say that this is decreasing. Why not start with the decrease? I'm going to say it's decreasing when the x value is less than negative 4. And it's also decreasing when the x value is greater than 4. I'm going to say it's increasing between negative 4 and positive 4. So x is in between negative 4 and positive 4. And you might be thinking, well, what about at negative 4? What about at 4? Well, it's doing neither because it flattens out perfectly. And it flattens out like this. When it does that, that is technically a slope of zero, which is neither increasing nor decreasing. Lots of calculus stuff uh, that you'll see when you deal with calculus, but that's my guy. Estimate the relative extrema. Relative extrema 
is a fancy word for saying, where do I have the top of the hill? Where do I have the bottom of the hill? Knowing very well that this is going to forever be going up and forever going to be going down. Well, here's the top of the hill. Here's the bottom of a valley. I guess you wouldn't say bottom of a hill. And so I would say that there is a relative maximum, a relative maximum at the point looks like zero, negative three. There's going to be a relative minimum when there's a bottom of a valley, and that appears to be right here to, uh, what is that, negative seven. And again, the purpose of relative is I know this isn't the absolute minimum because this guy keeps going down forever. And I know this isn't the absolute maximum because that guy keeps going up forever. But if we were to ignore the up and down forever part, where do I have my maximum? Where do I have my minimum? Top of the hill, bottom of the valley, those are my two points. Find the average rate of change over the interval three and ooh, 13 over four. Well, that's going to be fun, especially because my function has a square in it. Mm. Average rate of change, what is that? Well, it's basically slope. And the way you find average rate of change is you do f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Now, what's b and what's a? Your b and your a, or your a and your b. So let's find out what f of b and what f of a are. Let's go in order from easiest to not so easy. f of a is going to be the same as f of 3. f of 3 means I take 3 and I plug it into every x up here. So 3 squared minus regular 3 minus 1. 3 squared is 9 minus 3 is 3 minus 1 is going to equal 9 minus 3 is 6. 6 minus 1 is 5. Bada bing. So f of a is 5. a was 3. Now on to the rough stuff. f of b, which is the same as f of 13 over 4. Mm-hmm. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 13 over 4, I'm going to plug it into this function, and I'm going to square it, subtract it, minus 1. So I got 13 over 4 squared minus 13 over 4 minus 1. 13 over 4 squared means you multiply 13 over 4 times itself. So 13 times 13 is the numerator. That's 169. 4 times 4 is the denominator. That's 16. What I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite 13 over 4 so that it has a denominator of 16 so I can deal with fractions. So let's multiply the top and the bottom of this guy by 4. So if you multiply 13 by 4, that gives me 52. And 4 times 4 is 16. And now I can deal with those fractions. Minus, let's turn 1 into 16 over 16 by multiplying it by 16 over 16. 169 minus 52 is 117. 117 is a six, a 101, my favorite amount of Dalmatians. Look at that. 101 over 16, that's f of b. Let's plug stuff in. So f of b ended up being 101 over 16 minus f of a, which ended up being mm, 5. Let's do this. Let's turn 5 into something over 16 by multiplying 5 to 16 over 16, which is going to be 80 over 16. So that's just the numerator. All of that is going to be over b minus a, which is 13 over 4 minus a, which is 3. So why don't I turn a into something over 4 by multiplying u by 4 over 4. So you're going to be 12 over 4. Oh, that's actually going to turn out quite nice. 101 sixteenths minus 80 
sixteenths is nine plus ten sixteenths. It's a joke. Look it up. Thirteen minus twelve is one over four. A fraction divided by a fraction means multiply the top part by its reciprocal. So something divided by one fourth is the same thing as times four over one. So these guys simplify to 21 over 4. That's my average rate of change. Not pretty, not pretty at all, but a lot of fun. G of n equals negative n plus 5. F of n equals n squared minus 1 find g of f of n. This is called a composite function. So even though it looks like this, I'm going to rewrite it so that it looks like this. g of f of 6. What I'm going to do first is I'm just going to find out what f of 6 is. f of 6 means I take f of n and throw in 6 for every n there. So 6 squared minus 1 is going to be 36 minus 1, which is 35. So f of 6 is 35. So g of f of 6 is the same thing as saying g of 35. Got to get my colors right. So I could take 35 and substitute 35 into g. So it's going to be negative 35 in a parentheses, I guess. Just got to look proper. Plus 5, negative 35 plus 5 is negative 30. So g of f of 6 is negative 30 composite functions. Write g of x, which is this dashed line here, in terms of f of x, which is this solid line here. All right, so g of x is f of x with stuff happening to it. So let's write out the stuff that happens. f of x gets flipped upside down. And gets moved to the left, uh, looks like one, two, three times, so left three. Whenever you flip something upside down, what you do is you multiply the function by a negative. So by flipping it, I'm throwing a negative here. If I move to the left three, I take the x value, and I know this is going to sound crazy, but when you move left, you're actually going to add a number to x. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to add 3 to it on the inside of the parentheses. So g of x is now negative f of x plus 3. So no moving up or down. If I were to move up, I'd add something. If I were to move down, I'd subtract something outside the parentheses. If I had moved right, I'd subtract something in here, and this was negative because I flipped it upside down. So that is g of x. Fun, fun. Sketch the piecewise function. More like piece of garbage, not wise function. You like that? I did. No one likes these. I don't like them either. But here we are. Uh, I have essentially three graphs being drawn on the same picture, but I only care about what happens in specific areas. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to graph the entire function where it needs to be, and then I'm going to cut it off where I have to cut it off. If I were to graph f of x equals negative 4, it's just going to be a straight line along negative 4 right here, but you know what? I only care about this line when x is less than or equal to negative 2. So I'm going to put a little circle right there. I'm going to put my little arrow there. And I'm going to erase all the stuff that is greater than negative 2 because I don't care about this guy once it hits negative 2. I'm trying to just clean that up right there. How about that? So you are in red. Happy day. 
Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, oh, by the way, fill in the circle because you're including negative two. Don't know if I said that. Here, I'm not in including any or either negative two or regular two. I'm going to graph the equation x minus two from negative two to positive two. So let's graph x minus two regularly. Start at negative two. I go up one over one, up one over one. And you know what I'm going to do? Since I'm supposed to stop at two, I'm going to make this a circle, not filled in. If I were to keep going down here, I'd go down, make that a circle, not filled in, but it doesn't matter because it's continuous. How about that? And this just is a regular old diagonal, perfectly straight line. Now, the last guy is probably the most challenging to graph because I'm going to start graphing it up here and erasing a lot of stuff, right? When you graph something in slope-intercept form, it's usually easy to start, you know, at the y-intercept. So I'm going to do that knowing that some of this is going to be erased. My slope is negative 2, so up 2 over 1, up 2 over 1, knowing that this is pointless. Literally, it's, there's no points there. But if I keep graphing the slope of negative 2 here, here, I do include regular 2, so I'm going to fill that in, making this continuous, and I'm just going to keep going down to right 1, down to right 1, down to right 1, down to right 1. These guys connect, making a perfect straight line, as you can see from my drawing. There you go. I'm going to get rid of these guys. And there's my piecewise function. Everything connects. Will that always happen that they connect? No, it's just this one was designed to connect. There you have it, piecewise function. This one was not so bad, but they do get bad. Find the inverse of f of x equals 2 over 7x minus 10 over 7. All right, so the best way to find the inverse is I'm going to pretend that f of x is y for now, just because it'll make things look a whole lot nicer. I suggest that when you do problems like these, you do the same. The first step that you do is you swap the x and the y. That's step number one. So y is now x and x is now y. Now my job is to solve for this new y. So I have myself a literal equation where I have to get y all by itself. Step number one, add 10 over 7 to both sides. Add 10 over 7 to both sides. x plus 10 over 7 don't combine, so I just have x plus 10 over 7. That's going to equal 2 over 7y. Now, I still have to get y all by itself, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply both sides by this reciprocal here, which is 7 over 2. I'm going to multiply both sides by 7 over 2, so I've got distributed property going on, but that allows y to be all by itself. Okay, so y is now all by itself on the right. 7 over 2 times x is just 7 over 2 times x. 7 over 2 times 10 over 7 allows the 7s to cancel out. 10 over 2 becomes 5 over 1, which is just 5. So I get plus 5. Now what I'm going to do to make this look a whole lot better is I'm going to move the y to the left and move this guy over here to the right, 7 over 2x plus 5. Remember, I turned f of x into y, so I'm going to turn uh, y back into f of x. But since this is my inverse, I'm going to make that f inverse of x equals 7 over 2x plus 5. That is my inverse function. Can't spell inverse function without fun.